You're listening to Humans in Tech. Our podcast explores today's most transformative technology and the trends of tomorrow, bringing together the brightest minds in and outside of our industry. We unpack what's new in physical access, identity verification, cybersecurity, and IoT ecosystems. We reach beyond the physical world, discuss our digital transformation as a species, and dive into the emerging digital experience. Join us on our journey as we discover just how connected the future will be and how we will fit into that picture. Your host is Lee Dow, VP of Global Marketing at Identiv. Welcome, welcome to Humans in Tech. Today we've got a pretty fun topic for us, not so fun for others. We're talking about epic cybersecurity fails. We're joined by journalist Drew Todd, who covers cybersecurity at media outlet Secure World News. For 20 years, Secure World has been tackling global cybersecurity issues and sharing critical knowledge and tools needed to protect against ever-evolving threats. Hi, Drew. Thanks for coming on our podcast today. Hi, Lee. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Tell us how you ended up as a journalist covering cybersecurity and what it's like to just you know, cover such a major tech beat in today's you know, really fast-changing world. So it's kind of interesting for me. I feel like for a lot of people, you know, you didn't set out to work in cybersecurity. Um, there's a lot of different paths that people I've talked to that they have getting into cyber. And so I graduated from college at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. So it was a joy trying to find a job. Um, and I just kind of stumbled onto my role here at Secure World. Um, and it kind of just uh, our boss asked me to do one thing and then it kind of snowballed into a whole job. And now I am pretty much our main journalist and content person. So I've been covering cybersecurity issues for about a year and a half. And it's been really fascinating to me as someone who didn't study cybersecurity in school. I've learned a ton about the industry and it seems like every single day there is some something new uh, breaking issue that a lot of people are talking about, um, some new cyber attack, ransomware. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been kind of a joy for me to learn a lot about the industry and cover cybersecurity. Did you study journalism or something else technical or both or neither? <laughs> um, I, I actually graduated with a degree in economics. And so I guess I've just always sort of had a knack for writing um, and my company recognized that pretty quickly. Um, they asked me at first, they were like, hey, do you think you can write an article or two about this? And I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. And, and then uh, everyone was like, wow, like you, you seem like you're doing a really good job. And so I just, I kept going and kept writing. And so it's been, it's been fun for me to uh, learn about all of that. Ooh, economics is hard. I'm a poli sci major, and I really, really didn't like my economics classes very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was uh, not easy. <laughs> um, recently, you did an article on the top ten data breaches of all time. Um, you know, tell me about that article. Um, you know, why you wanted to write about that? What the criteria was that you chose for you know the worst data breaches? There's probably so many to choose from. Yeah, so like a lot of articles that I write, I just want to share interesting information about the industry. So with the top 10 data breaches story, I pretty much just researched and come through uh, the top breaches of the last decade or so and put a list together. It's pretty difficult to define exactly what the top data breaches are because there's so much criteria that goes into that. So if you look at my article, you'll notice that I didn't number them one through 10. There's just 10 there because it would be pretty hard to pick exactly what goes at the top and what, what goes at the bottom. Um, but basically I just looked at things like how many individual records were compromised, um, what information was involved, was it sensitive personal information um, and what sort of damages did the company have to pay? Were they fined from a government agency, from a regulator? Um, did they have to pay out uh, any lawsuits or anything like that? And then uh, who was the attacker? You know, was it a, a state-sponsored attacker? Was it China or Russia or North Korea? And so pretty much all of those things went into choosing a list. Um, you're absolutely right. There's so many data breaches that you could choose from. Um, so it's, it, took me, it took me a while to find 
what I felt like the top 10 were. Um, and it's just great. Uh, it's sort of not fun for the companies that are involved, but it's fun, sort of fun to just go back and look at, wow, like I, I kind of forgot that that data breach happened. Oh, there were 3 billion records involved or wow, they had their social security information leaked. Um, and so that's pretty much what went into that article. One of the things that I think is really interesting is the rise of like the ransom, you know, where hacks uh, and and that topic is just fascinating to me because, you know, it's it's a pretty recent, you know, as far as, you know, technology terms, it's it's actually a pretty recent trend. Yeah, absolutely. Ransomware has been uh, probably the issue at the forefront of most executives minds because you you hear about stories where. Uh, a company gets hacked and then they have all of their data is locked and they can't, they can't operate their business normally. And so then it's like the, the threat actor, the cyber criminal is asking them to pay this exorbitant fee to unlock their own data. And it's, pr it's pretty concerning, especially for smaller organizations that don't have the resources to either recover their assets or, or pay the cyber criminals money. And so it's a tricky situation for a lot of people. And that's why it's been, it's become such a huge issue. You're, you're seeing uh, news stations talk about ransomware on your nightly news and you were not seeing that a few years ago. Well, and even in pop culture, right? I think there's a Grey's Anatomy episode on, on a ransom attack, ransomware attack. <laughs> Yeah, well, I haven't seen Grey's Anatomy, but I'm sure it's probably an interesting episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we just discussed, uh, cyber attacks can really affect all different industries from airports to banking, educational institutions, investment companies, retailers, you know, the list goes on. Um, and the federal government is also a constant target for threat actors. Are there any industries that you notice to be more or less prone to cyber attacks? Um, everybody is prone to a cyber attack. There's no industries that are completely safe, but I would say since the beginning of the pandemic, the healthcare sector has been frequently targeted by cyber actors because of the sensitive information that they're containing with, uh, the vaccine and everybody is now going and checking up with their doctor. So everyone's been looking at the healthcare sector trying to find any vulnerabilities they can, because if you attack, if you attack a hospital, they, and, and it's a life threatening situation, they pretty much have to pay right away because you can't, you can't not give somebody the care that they need because, because of a ransomware attack. And so that, that's been a huge issue for the healthcare sector. And then I'd also say the education sector is pretty frequently targeted. And it's really difficult for the education sector because unlike a lot of other industries, they lack the funding and tools to appropriately react to a cyber incident. Um, I recently covered a story for the Los Angeles Unified School District, the second biggest school district in the country, was hit with a ransomware attack. And I don't, they didn't make the number public what the ransomware actor was asking for, but the superintendent of the dis district just came out and said, like, there's no way we're, we're even having a conversation about paying the ransom. Uh, we like most schools barely have the funding to get their teachers, the tools they need for their classroom, right. let alone pay for pay or pay a, $500,000 ransom fee because they got hacked and their their data is exposed. So I'd say the health healthcare, edu healthcare sector and the education sector are two that I look at pretty frequently. See, healthcare, Shonda Rhimes, the genius who writes Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so, you know, cybersecurity is also an issue on social media platforms. You recently reported on cybersecurity problems at Twitter posing a national threat and also how TikTok has denied claims of a massive data breach. Tell us about what you found there. Yeah, so this is something, this is pretty interesting and incredibly concerning to me. The more that you read about um, cybersecurity with social media, um, it doesn't, doesn't make you exactly feel great. Um, the story that I covered was the former head of security for Twitter, 
uh, Peter Zatko, also known as Mudge, has been an uh, industry leader for decades, um, was a whistleblower for Twitter and said that Twitter was covering up some of their most severe vulnerabilities and misleading the board and government regulators. And he also believed that one or more employees was working for a foreign intelligence service. And so the, when you read stuff like that, it's incredibly concerning because of the elections that we had in 2020. There was so much concern about that. Is, is Russia hacking and messing with our stuff? What is China doing? Um, Zacco also mentioned that Twitter doesn't, rely, doesn't reliably delete user data after canceling an account and that Twitter doesn't have the resources to understand the number of bots on the platform. And so I've, I've read about a ton of stories where people think that the, there's so many bots on social media platforms that are purposely spreading, spreading misinformation and making everything more confusing for all of us and making people argue with each other. And it's something that our, I think our country and the world at this moment in time is something we really don't need to add that to the mix of everything we have going on. Yeah, um, I, um, I've written quite a bit about disinformation architecture and, um, and the bots are a big part of that, right? Because what they do is they um, sort of take people, they sort of identify people who are you know, vulnerable to go down a rabbit hole of disinformation and then they bring them down that rabbit hole and sort of keep them there in, in a bubble. Um, and keep feeding them more and more of that disinformation uh, and in ways that feel very authentic. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you probably hear all the time about like your aunt or uncle on Facebook is sending out these random, random messages that they get and they, they believe it because they have been, they've been fed all of this misinformation and then you read what they're sending you and you're like, this doesn't make any sense, Uncle yeah. Joe. No, oh, I think um, we all have that aunt or uncle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for and then, sure. Uh, even with with TikTok, TikTok is a whole other issue from Twitter. Um, it's obviously a Chinese based company. And the issue with that being all companies in China, if the government asks them for information, they don't have a choice but to give the Chinese government the information that they have. And so I've read about where the TikTok al algorithm is kind of terrifying. I'm, I don't know if you are on TikTok or not. I but can go down a TikTok rabbit hole like nobody's business. Yeah, their, their algorithm <laughs> knows exactly what you want to look at. Um, so the way that they've, I've read about how it's kind of coordinated is in China, they're showing their own, own citizens uh, like really upbeat, happy things like promoting, uh, promoting good causes or whatever or kind of propaganda for the government. And then in the U S specifically there, there's more, um, more negative videos, more videos of people just dancing and kind of mindless things. And so it's interesting how it's possible that the Chinese government is kind of manipulating, uh, social media to over time kind of negatively affect uh, people that use it uh, in the U.S., in Europe, and I mean, really just everywhere around the world. Yeah, apparently they believe that I have a deep, you know, significant um, need to see Bama Rush. Because um, <laughs> that, that got fed to me for a while there <laughs> during, yeah. during Rush, yeah. Bama Rush. Um, which I, I don't know why, because I didn't go to an SEC school. In fact, I went to an ACC school. So the last thing I want to see is Bama Rush. Um, right. And right. then I'm um, pretty sure I got some of those videos. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I guess the Chinese government is probably gathering a lot of information about how much I like food and fashion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely food for me, too. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the top vulnerabilities actively exploited by hackers? Um, there are... What I would say to this, the top vulnerabilities exploited by hackers are the ones that they can get to easily, the ones that are right there, ready to be hacked. Um, but aside from the easy one, the one that I would point out is the log for shell vulnerability has really been giving everybody a headache since it emerged in late 2021. Um, it's essentially a software flaw in the Apache log4j logging utility. 
Um, and the reason it's been such an issue is because of the number of apps and web services that rely on Log4j, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, all like heavily rely on it. And so it created a exceptionally broad attack surface for threat actors. Um, and so that has been a major issue that I've listened to multiple speakers at our Secure World conferences talk about. Um, they always like number one, what's the top vulnerability? They say log for shell has been giving everybody issues. And then aside, aside from the log for shell vulnerability, there's a lot of others that you could pick. And so any, any chance I get to highlight CISA, uh, the U S government organization, they do just an incredible job in the last few years, especially with Jen Easterly being the director now. Um, I encourage everyone to go look at their known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. Um, they have so many vulnerabilities listed and so many other resources. So if you're listening and you have a chance, check out CISA.gov. They have so much info on the top vulnerabilities that they're more than willing to share. I've been seeing a lot lately on hacktivists. I mean, I suppose in some ways Anonymous started that trend. You know, people who gain unauthorized access to computer files or networks in order to further, you know, a social or political end. Uh, you must see more stories like this emerging, especially close to elections, not only in our own country, but others. Yeah, absolutely. You hit it uh, right on the nail with Anonymous. Um, the situation with Ukraine and Russia is pretty much a daily battle. If you're looking for a story on cybersecurity, pretty much all you have to do is type into Google Ukraine, Russia, cyber, and there'll be something new. Um, at the beginning of the conflict, Anonymous came out and announced that it was declaring a cyber war on Russia de uh, defending Ukraine. And so they kind of got their army of hackers pretty much just being uh, pesky individuals doing whatever they can to uh, disrupt Russian activities um, any way that they can get to Putin, any way that they can disrupt uh, high level or uh, high level organizations and traffic within Russia. So that's been really interesting to follow with hacktivists. Um, there was an interesting story a little bit ago, uh, Russian hackers hacked a, uh, a radio network in Ukraine and they spread misinformation on Zelensky and said that Zelensky was like sick and dying in the hospital. And they broadcast that over the radio. And so a bunch of people in Ukraine started freaking out and they're like, oh my gosh, is our president okay? And then he, Zelensky came out himself and posted a selfie. He's like, I'm, I'm good. Like the no, no need to worry. That's just Russian hackers doing their thing. Um, and so it's stuff like that daily in Ukraine and Russia. And then uh, even more recently, the situation in Iran has been really interesting to follow. Um, there was a young woman who, uh, was detained by police for not wearing her hijab and she died in police custody. And since then there's been uh, outbreaks across the country protesting. Um, and so hacktivists have come to the citizens of Iran's aid, trying to help them in any way that they can. Iran is limiting uh, internet access. And so people are sharing VPNs and other types of things just to just to help the people of Iran fight back against the uh, kind of brutal regime over yeah. there. Enter Starlink. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've been following that story really closely. And there um, just in the last few days, there was a young woman who was participating. Uh, she's a climber, I believe, participating in a um, uh, outside of the country event and um, didn't wear her hijab or I think any of her required, um, you know, um, yeah, I saw that too. Uniform, yeah. and uh, and then uh, went back uh, to Iran and I think nobody's heard from her since. Um, and yeah. so, and that's a really great example of how you know hacktivism, um, you know, maybe isn't such a bad thing where you know these you've got all of these people who are mobilized and and they're in the streets and they're protesting and they're really risking their lives and their future, um, you know, in order to try to make some, you know, social change, uh, political change. And, um, and that's where, you know, hacktivists come in. Um, but it is really interesting that trend of hacktivism to me because uh, it's really a t 
totally different kind of grassroots. Um, and grassroots, you know, I, I started my career in politics, and so like grassroots is is one of the best ways to make social change or political reform or anything like that because you know you get that groundswell of people um, that are too big and too um, too connected to ignore. And um, so I just find the hacktivism piece really interesting because it's sort of the modern day's take on, you know, social marches and things like that, you know, for social change. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think most most stories that I read about uh, hacktivists and hacktivism, they're usually they're usually doing it for a good cause. And so it's kind of encouraging to see when a, a huge group of people like anonymous, they're like, OK, Russia is invading Ukraine what can we do to help the citizens of Ukraine in this time of need? And the same thing in Iran. And so it's it's cool to see those stories. Well, it's also just, you know, it, it allows for people who are not local to support and participate in in making those changes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's not really uncommon for cybersecurity companies to be the targets of attacks. You've covered that angle, right? Yes, I, I have covered that angle before. It's sort of something that I try to avoid as much as I can as pure <laughs> world partners with a lot of these right. companies. So it's like I don't want to really paint anybody in a bad light and then they're like, oh, we're your sponsor, but you just wrote this article ripping into us on our cybersecurity. So I do I do cover it if it's a story that warrants it, um, definitely. Uh, it's been Interesting. I don't know if you've followed the story with the Lapsus group. No. Um, Lapsus is a sort of new cyber gang that emerged earlier this year, and they pulled off hacks of NVIDIA, Samsung, Ubisoft, Microsoft, Okta, the like government of Brazil, and a bunch of other people. And after pulling off all these hacks on these huge tech companies, uh, they're leaking source code and internal documents. And so it really puts, specifically for cybersecurity companies, it puts the executives in quite a pickle for paying the ransom or having your source code for your your lead product be leaked to the on the dark web mm -hmm. and sold to the highest bidder, essentially. But what I love about this story is that uh, the mastermind of the lapsus group is reportedly a 16, 16 or 18 year old kid. Of course it lives, is. Of course it is. His, I know, <laughs> I know, who lives with his mom in London. And so uh, after they pulled, they pulled off all these high level breaches within a really short span. And so of course the authorities took notice and they arrested seven individuals in London and all of them were teenagers. And so it's just it's like crazy to think that a group of teenagers can get together and be like, OK, what are we going to do today? Oh, we're going to hack the <laughs> four biggest tech companies in the world and steal their source code for funsies. And so, yeah, just 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 for funsies. Um, and so that's that's been a fun story to follow. Um, it's obviously just attention grabbing because of the big companies involved and then the, the, the teenagers, the reported 16 year old mastermind behind the operations. How do you spell that? Uh, Lapsus. Lapsus is L A P S U S, and then they add a dollar sign after the S. Of course so, they do. Yeah. Because <laughs> they got to get yeah. the, the like hip hop, yeah, hip -hop thing in there. In there. Yeah. <laughs> like their yeah. Kesha or whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and you know what's funny is uh, I, I have gone on rants before about schools that still teach um, cursive. Instead of teaching, oh my God. <laughs> instead of teaching kids to code, I'm like, you should be using that time to teach kids to code because that's what they're going to need to like run their households and stuff. But now I might take that back after hearing that yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, I've never thought about that. I've never once used cursive. No, of course uh, not. In my adult life, and I there's nothing. And in today's world yeah. where we all docusign, there's absolutely nothing magical about scribbling your name versus <laughs> printing it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with you, though. Even <laughs> despite the teenage hackers, let's start teaching. Let's start teaching coding at a young age yeah, instead right? of cursive. Exactly. Yeah, I think that would be hugely beneficial for everybody. Completely agree. Um, so, okay, so what is the annual global damage and cost from these attacks? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Does is it staying the same? So, unfortunately, I have to say that it's 
getting worse and it's probably only going to continue to get worse for a while. Um, there's just, there's so many things that, uh, uh, threat actors can target nowadays with everything being connected to the internet. Um, I've since since the pandemic started, obviously the transition to remote work has increased the attack surface for uh, threat actors, and so everybody's working remotely. Everybody is on whether they're connected to the cloud or connected to a VPN, and so there's just so many ways for threat actors to get into your network and start stealing your information and your data. Um, I've seen reports that cybercrime is up 600% since the beginning of COVID, um, that it costs uh, roughly the, the world $6 trillion a wow. year. Um, and I've seen estimates that say that it could rise to $10 trillion by 2025. And something that I think that's interesting to note is that a lot of, a lot of cybercrime goes unreported. And so we have actual data on what gets reported, but if 60% of cybercrime or how, whatever percentage it is, isn't reported, we don't have any, we don't have accurate numbers on a lot of things. Cause especially um, if a, if a huge company gets breached and they're doing their best to kind of like keep it under wraps, even though they're probably supposed to report it. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of that going on. Um, that's just un that's just unreported, and so we don't really know. Um, I know that, like, for an average organization, the average data breach costs like four million dollars. Like, depending on um, what information gets involved, like, if you have personal information that gets leaked, you'll probably have lawsuits, and eventually, you'll have to pay out your uh, customers money for damages. Um, and so. I really wish that I could say I see it getting better. I just don't know how, I don't know how we get there. I know right now there's a huge uh, labor shortage in cybersecurity. Something, something like 3 million jobs globally are unfilled in cyber. And I know that it's been increasing in the last year because cybersecurity is sort of uh, gaining popularity. People are, I think five years ago, you asked somebody what's cybersecurity. They're like, I have no idea. The well, and it means so many different my, things, right? There's so many different jobs in cybersecurity. And even like, um, I have a few friends that work for the FBI and like the FBI has even retooled um, many of their agents to, you know, give them cybersecurity training and be cybersecurity focused. Yeah, I think that's, that's a huge thing that a lot of organizations have been pushing in the last year or so is just cyber training and awareness you know it's a, a lot of pe a lot of people just don't know what to look for and so the more that the more that everybody can spread awareness and train your employees will eventually i think the number will climb down you know as we get better tools to protect ourselves and our organizations it's just right now with the with the labor shortage I just don't know how, I don't know how it gets better sooner. I think in the long run, it will eventually get better. Ideally, you know, in 20 years, every we have great, great coding. Everybody is aware, everybody is trained, and then we can really start to limit incidents. But it's just, it's just gonna take time. So um, I Googled the Lapsus Hacking Group, and one of the first, oh, yeah. one of the first stories that came up, this is just perfection. Um, it mentions that Claire Tills, a senior researcher or senior research engineer at Tenable, describes the methods of the hacking group Lapsus as bold, illogical, and poorly thought out. And as the mother of a teenage boy, if that doesn't a hundred percent describe <laughs> what a group of sixteen-year-old hackers would be like, I don't know what does. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so great. Um, so I can't thank you enough for joining us on this episode. I definitely would love to have you back to talk about, you know, some of the crypto crimes and um, other things like that that are uh, in that, you know, cyber criminal world. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of them. Yeah, let's do that. Um, hopefully we're all more informed about cyber threats lurking out there and how to take precautions against them. Definitely go check out Drew's um, articles with um, Secure World News.
And um, if you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe. We'll drop a new episode every Thursday. Eliminate the risk of data breaches, phishing, password theft, and replay attacks with hardened multi-factor authentication cybersecurity. Passwordless logins are simple and secure with Utrust FIDO2 NFC Plus security keys. Insert the device, tap the button, and get secure access. It really is that easy. Learn more at identive.com. We design powerful NFC-enabled identity solutions that seamlessly integrate into kiosks, terminals, vending machines, slot machines, betting machines, and more. Our new Utrust NFC Kiosk Kit features our contactless USB CCID Utrust 3523 F-Reader module. NFC antenna and highly customizable LED array. The kit can easily support loyalty cards and digital wallets. If you're ready to add NFC to your slot machine or kiosk, speak to an expert today at identive.com. Physical security, identity verification, the IoT. The hyperconnectivity of our lives will only grow more pervasive. As technology becomes more automated and experiences more augmented, it's up to us to preserve our humanity and use new tools and trends for good. The only question is, are we up for the challenge?